Oma, are you able to hear me? Okay, I can see you, but I can't hear you yet. Yes, hi everyone. Perfect, hi. okay, good, good. I just wanted to make sure that we had a, a sound check before we started, thank you. So if I can, I'm gonna ask uh, everyone to mute themselves uh, until they're called upon uh, as speakers or as attendees. Uh, to those who are attending the session, you're most welcome to use the chat function uh, to share any thoughts or questions or comments that you may have. Um, I'll go through a more formal introduction in a second, uh, but we'll just wait, I'm just looking at the clock, one more minute, just to make sure that we have everybody time to join us. All right, let's get started. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever it is you are. Uh, welcome to the International Federation of Adaptive Physical Activities uh, side event for the Global Disability Summit. And we're going to be focusing today on adapted physical education from a global perspective uh, and focusing in particular on a post-COVID, <laughs> let's, let's hope it's post soon, as we're moving out of the global pandemic. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, my name is David Leg. I'm the president of the International Federation of Adapted Physical Activity as a volunteer. Um, professionally, I am a faculty member at Mount Royal University, which is in Calgary, Alberta, Canada. And I'm also the past president of the Canadian Paralympic Committee. And it gives me great pleasure uh, to introduce to you eight speakers that are going to be talking about, again, adapted physical education from their own perspectives and their own uh, regional and national perspectives. And we're gonna crisscross the globe uh, in this next hour. And speakers have been asked to speak for approximately kind of five to eight minutes each on their uh, local context. And we will be entertaining questions if you wish throughout the chat. So by all means, uh, throw your questions in there. And as speakers finish their presentations, they can respond to it that way. And then at the end, we'll open it up for a more global question and answer and discussion uh, period then. In addition to that, we also have a live transcription available. So if you click on that, uh, it's not something that we've used a lot. So we're still learning, we're, we'll, we're still somewhat newbies to, to using this technology. And my understanding is that it will translate into your local language. So again, uh, no promises, but uh, we think that that may work. So hopefully you're able to access that and use that. So without further ado, please let me introduce our eight speakers, and then we will go uh, one at a time uh, through each one. We'll start with Anna Metta, who is joining us uh, today from Norway. Our second speaker will be Rosa, who will be joining us from Turkey. Our third speaker will be Ciro, uh, who will be joining us from Brazil. Claire will then be next, joining us from France. We'll then crisscross the Atlantic uh, to Canada where Homa will be joining us also from Calgary in Western Canada. We'll then go back across the Atlantic uh, and you can do all of this without having to take the tests and to spend all the money on your PBR test. So this is an inexpensive way to travel the globe. We'll come back across the ocean to Finland where Kwok will be speaking. We'll then go south to Jordan where Omar will be speaking. And then finally, we'll uh, finish in Kenya where uh, Peter Bukala will be joining us and talking about adaptive physical education from that context. So without further ado, uh, Anna Metta, it's your chance to speak. Um, thank you again for joining us. I will put your slides up and Anna Metta, I, uh, Anna Metta is, a, is a person with lived experience with a visual impairment. And so I will change your slides just based on your hand. So if you wanna raise your hand and let me know, it's time to change slides. I will be happy to do that. We are on your first slide, Anna Metta. 
Thank you so much. It's uh, really an honor to be able to kick this uh, talk off. And I'm very excited to take part. And uh, just the thought of people uh, listening in from many places in the world is very exciting. So I think my presentation here will be a short introduction to some thoughts concerning the pandemic time and also the post-pandemic time. Uh, my name is Annemette Bredal and I am a clinical psychologist and I'm a researcher also um, at the TRS National Resource Center for People with Rare Disorder. Um, I'm working at the Rehabilitation Hospital, but I'm also here as a disability liaison in IFAPA and uh, very happy to join you here today. I already screwed up once, that's, a, that's terrible. <laughs> that's fine, yeah. Uh, I have done some thoughts uh, with regard to the pandemic and uh, there's some perspectives I'd like to share with you. Uh, because for all of us, the pandemic was a new experience for us and it changed people's lives worldwide. It, it did for a period and maybe also for the future to come for better and worse. When I speak about the Nordic uh, perspective, so in my country, uh, many has taken education for granted. I know it's not like that in every country, but it's been like that in, uh, in my country. And I think as far as I can remember, there's never ever been so many um, students protesting against not being able to go to school. <laughs> People were really longing to go back to school. Uh, we all had to do a crash course in uh, creating digital meeting places, just like this one, but we had to learn very quickly. Uh, it also showed that it gave great opportunities for participants to participate in conferences and meetings. Also for those who were, are less financial fortunate and people with disabilities. And that was also something I got feedback as a disability liaison in IFAPA. But it also made us very aware of the importance of being able to meet up each other physically again. And I think we are all longing and hoping that we will soon be able to go to conferences, not just on screen, but also in person. Yes. If I talk about the PE and the situation in the Nordic countries, um, in, our, in the Nordic countries, the, the vast um, majority of the children attend ordinary schools and they are also meant to follow the ordinary schools. But research has showed that we are, even that we got some way, we are still challenging in making PE a good experience for everybody, including people with disability. There's still a lack of good systems for having APA specialists who can guide PE teachers locally in to adapt PE lessons so it becomes good experiences. And I know that's different in different regions of the world, but even in our end of the world, even though we have many good APA specialists, we don't have a very good system of making very good use of them. So we have some improvement to do. And when we talk about the pandemic, there was a lot of focus about making sure that students got the essential. And unfortunately, PE was not often looked upon as some that was the most essential. It was more math, the local language, maybe English, that was the most essential. And pupils and the families, we got reports that the people with special needs lost valuable support and opportunities. Yes. So the experiences during the pandemic, uh, I've tried to sum up some of the reactions that I have uh, collected both in research, but also in my practical work and as a disabled person myself, and as a psychologist. During the pandemic, uh, there was limitation to the availabil availability and possibility of taking part in physical activity. 
people reported they lost physical functions and fitness, something that they felt was very important to their everyday life. So being without something for, for a while really meant a lot to their everyday life. They also lost social arenas, both in school and in leisure time when that was shut down. They lost the opportunity to, to have fun with their friends and peers, both in school and outside. So they also reported how they are looking forward to returning to normal life. Last slide. But there was also good things during the pandemic. Youth and young adults that we have been in contact with with disabilities have also rep uh, reported some good times and consequences of the um, pandemic. They reported that never before had they felt so normal interacting through their screen. Their usual disability that was present, if whether that was a wheelchair, a sight impairment, uh, or they were short stature or whatever it was, was kind of hidden. And they, it was a period where they felt very normal. There was lots of things that was not happening and they were part of the big group that had nothing happening for them. And some even reported to that had concerns with the guard to going back, facing people's gaze again and feeling and being the one that was different. And on the good note, it also created international based support groups during the pandemic. And there were many more good initiatives regarding APA, which was happening both in my country and as my colleagues would report from other places in the world. So I really hope I will finish this with saying, I really hope that we will take care of the best what we have learned during the pandemic, and then we will move on. And by that, I will say we'll need to move on to the next speaker because we have lots of interesting topics to cover. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Annemette. And I'm really glad that you also focused on the positive elements uh, of the pandemic. It's, it's hard to do that sometimes, but I'm glad that you made an opportunity, you took that opportunity to do exactly that. So we're leaving Norway, uh, we're flying southeast. I'm going to show off my understanding of geography in this presentation today. And we're going to go to Turkey, uh, where we're joined by Rosa. Rosa, over to you. Thank you, David. Uh, hello, everybody. Good evening, good night, good morning, wherever you are. Uh, this is Ashik Rosa Aksoy, a PhD candidate at Middle East Technical University and a researcher at University of Shurnak. I study and work in the field of adapted physical activity and I'm chairperson of IFAPA's new emerging specialist group, which calls NESAPA. And I'm sharing this with Alex Tribing. Uh, greetings to her. I'm on my late thirties with a long brown ha gray hair, wearing a black top and standing in front of my PC now with the bookshelves in the back. Now my presentation is shared on the screen and uh, it has a title of uh, COVID diverse solutions for a more inclusive future. Uh, can you go next slide, please? So to remember what happened is uh, that the COVID-19 has been declared as pandemic by World Health Organization on March 11, 2020, as you all remember very well, I'm sure. Afterwards, uh, COVID-19 has brought new challenges as well as new opportunities to the global education. Then UNESCO released a report named Global Education Monitoring All Means All, which addresses inclusive education that I'm going to read a short paragraph directly from the report. All, mean all, all means all identify the practices in governance and finance, curricula, textbooks, and assessments, teacher education, school infrastructure, and relations with students, parents, and communities that can unlock the process to inclusion. It provides policy recommendations to make learner diversity a strength to be celebrated, a force for social cohesion. This passage, this paragraph is very important. So over this paragraph, I'll be uh, telling you uh, two good samples from Turkey, what we created uh, after the pandemic. 
Uh, next slide, please. Uh, of course, the situation was the same in Turkey. Uh, lockdown declared and working, on, working and studying moved back into homes uh, through online platforms. And on March 12, 2020, the lockdown started and only after 10 days, the online platforms and materials for the schools were ready in Turkey. The Ministry of Ed National Education found uh, the online platform called Education Information Network. In a short way, we call it EBA. So I will address it as EBA during my presentation. EBA content prepared by the Council of uh, more than 800 teachers from different branches, and they prepared uh, pre-recorded videos for this platform. Later on, virtual classes, synchronous classes, free time activities were added inside the platform. All those content were prepared for all school levels, like early childhood education, primary education, elementary and high school. And uh, the EBO platform is a web-based uh, platform, but all its content is also accessible through six uh, different uh, channels on television. Besides academic content, EBO provides free time games, physically distant games, sports, movement activities, and athlete interviews to uh, attract uh, some attention to, to sports. Uh, now on the, on the slide on the screen, there's a QR code. You can read it and reach the platform if you would, would like to see it. it. It's in Turkish, but you can use easily the translator from Google, uh, from Chrome. And the address is www.eba.go.tr if you would like to see it. Yet, uh, next slide, please. The platform and the learning materials needed immediate improvement on being inclusive and accessible. Uh, around those days, the Association for the Visually Impaired in Education from Turkey published a report on EBA platform. And this report was uh, pointing out, pointing uh, some crucial points such as need of accessibility, audio description, inclusive content, need of internet and devices to reach out the platform, which was very crucial. Then uh, the Ministry of Education partnered with Turkish telecom company uh, to provide free internet for school children and provided eight gigabyte free internet uh, for students to reach EBA. And uh, for those who does not have enough PC, TV or smartphone at home, uh, the Ministry of Education opened EBA stations in every single district in all around the country for the children to follow their classes. I need to say that uh, the Ministry of Education provides uh, free tablets for the school children in Turkey uh, for elementary school uh, grades. But imagine you have siblings in different grades, so you need more than one device or more internet. So these EBA stations were really helpful, uh, especially in the rural areas for the children to reach to internet and uh, some more devices like PCs and laptops. Uh, can we go next, please? Uh, we can yeah, go, yes. Um, afterwards, uh, the platform were renewed again in last two years, of course, and uh, it was renewed to, to be more accessible for use of all the course content had audio description and sign language for the children with special educational needs or living with disabilities. Uh, but those who are in mainstream education system, so they could reach out to the educational materials like uh, other uh, their peers. And I must say that in Turkey, we have inclusion rather than separated schools for the students living with disabilities who can attend the mainstream uh, education. So, of course, all the materials needed to be uh, to create it as accessible. So now uh, there are two videos on the screen, uh, and the left one is showing the EBA platform. If uh, David, could you play it? And you can uh, mute the music. Yeah, that's cool. 
And uh, in the platform, it shows some samples from the class or the described content uh, and such. And on the right video, and now in, in EBA platform, you see there's a teacher uh, uh, telling, teaching some, some classes, but also uh, I put some uh, games, inclusive and adapted games for the children uh, to see, to watch through the television and to play at home or when they come together at school, those uh, games were created to to have for such cases. And on the right side of the screen, uh, there is uh, an application connected to EBA, which was also created by the Ministry of Education. This app calls, I am special, I am in education. And this is uh, providing more play and games and inclusive and adapted activities, not only physical activity purposes, but also to teach math or science through physical activity. So there are some, some games, uh, aims to teach, let's say some math, uh, but while you are playing the game, you are learning science or math. So this is for the uh, students with autism spectrum or other uh, students living with disabilities, but in mainstream education. There's also a report uh, about this app by OECD that you can find through the QR code again on the screen. Or if you want to uh, make a web search, you can use the keywords OECD report, I am special, I am in education. So EBA and I'm special, I'm in education are two inclusive solutions in education from Turkey. I just wanted to tell a little bit about them and thank you for your attention. Awesome. Thank you very much, Rosa. Um, our next speaker, so we're gonna cross the Atlantic uh, is Cyril Winkler, who's joining us this morning. Uh, I guess no early this afternoon uh, from Brazil. Cyril, over to you. Thank you, David. Good morning, good afternoon, good night around the world. Thank you for this invitation. It's an honor for me. But one, it's very difficult to explain my perspective of, of pandemic. If I didn't show, if it doesn't show for you, don't show for you this Brazilian scenario. The timeline of the pandemic here is terrible. We have two years. To uh, 26 million of COVID cases, we have 635,000 deaths in the last two years. In this scenario, it's very interesting to understand our problem, Brazil, because we have in the last census. Uh, 46 million of persons with impairments in Brazil. One more, David. Okay, one more. One, one, go, 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 go. <laughs> no problem, David, no problem, no problem, no problem. It's very interesting to understand I put three scenarios to understand the, pers the Brazilian perspective. The rehabilitation. Inside the rehabilitation, we have some investigations with the tele-exercise. And this was very difficult during these two years. We have a lockdown at the first two months in Brazil, and some process stopped during one year in case of rehabilitation. And the process restarted. The tele-exercise was very important to modify the scenario. This is the investigation of my PhD student, Rodrigo. Rodrigo stayed here with us in this meeting. And one more, David. The scenario of the power sport, we have another perspective. The perspective of sports, we stopped during 
one year. We restarted only after the, the postponed date of the Paralympic Games. During one year, the athletes stay home without coaches and using apps or another kinds of equipments to train home. This was very difficult because the athletes decreased the volume, decreased the intensity of the exercise. We have a lot of problems of uh, psychology and uh, mental health during this period. And the sport restart. And the third, third perspective, one more, they, we have the scenario of the schools. And the problems inside of schools was the most difficult scenario because the, the school stopped during the lockdown and restarted only this year, two years, the children stay home. And this is the problem of Brazil. Brazil is, is a big country with a big diversity. When I showed the last graphic about the, the population, I forgot the vaccine. At this moment, we have 72% of the, vac the vaccine in Brazil, the population with vaccine. We have 30% of the population without the vaccine. And this creates a big problem in this diversity because you have some regions like Sao Paulo state with 90% of the population. And we have the north of Brazil, Amazon forest with 10%. Associated with this information, we have the condition of the school because we have Sao Paulo and another states with access with technology like internet and others. And we have the population in the middle of Amazon forest. And we can add the condition of impairment in this population. The access about the rehabilitation is very interesting in big centers, but in some cities or regions, we have a big problem. In this perspective, the tele-exercise was very interesting during this period. But Peter or oh David, one more. Now the problem in my, in my perspective. I disagree, David. We don't have the post COVID. We will have the post pandemic. We will convive with the virus, I don't know, the next century, perhaps. Because this, I understand the post pandemic you need to understand the process because this was very important to understand my perspective in Brazil. I, in my point of view, IFAPA, South America, Federation, need to work in sanitary protocols, identify the sanitary protocols to work adapted physical exercise in sports or rehabilitation or in, school, in schools. What we can work with the same type of protocols. Example, if you go to the IPC website, the IPC use the information about able body sport. It's the same for the Paralympic sports. It's the same in the Special Olympics sports. You need to identify and work because this, the, the repository of, of ROSA is very important in this process. The second and very important for the post pandemic is the long COVID perspective, the long COVID syndromes. What is the impact of the long COVID in our population? We don't know, we don't have any research about these topics. We need to investigate. And I think we need to work in a global perspective in this point, because it's very difficult to have to identify one athlete in Brazil and in another countries. We need to work together in this, in this, problem, this point. And I think it's very difficult is the lost generation. The lost generation inside of the schools, the lost generation inside of the power sport. Because some, some athletes 
lost the physical literacy, the opportunities. Some athletes lost the sports opportunity. Some athletes lost the motor development windows. And we need to understand this process to provide support for these, these athletes. Example, again, in Brazil, we have the Paralympic School Games. We lost two years of these Paralympic School Games. What has happened with these talents? Lost? We need to understand this process in sport. The pathway of the athletes, in my opinion, will be after and before the pandemic. A question for you, Dave. And the last one, the most difficult, and I, did, I, I, for me, it's very difficult because my president in Brazil loves uh, lives with fake news. And this creates a big problem in my country. And unfortunately, in other countries, we have the same problems. The beliefs was the most difficult problems for the post pandemic because we need to create the sanitary protocols. And the person need belief in us, need to use this. Because this we need to create a new language to connect with the persons. We need to improve and promote the science with us. Of course, these four topics are connected, but we need to create bridges to understand the sanitary protocols in different countries, in my case, different regions of Brazil, understand the impact of the long COVID in our population, identify the impact of the lost, the lost generation, and fight against the fake news in our area. Maybe one more. Thank you, David. Thank you, Cyril. And I, as a as a father of three teenage boys, I'm very acutely aware of this impact that it's going to have in the last two years um, from a number of different perspectives. I, I very much enjoyed and appreciated your presentation. Thank you, and thank you for joining us. Um, if I can, I, I'm looking at the chat and I'm seeing that Ashling has you know posed a, a question, and I see that Quok is reiterating this. Please feel free to pose questions to our speakers as they present in the chat function as they come up and so that you don't forget them by the time we get to the Q&A at the very end. It now gives me great pleasure to introduce a former president of IFAPA, uh, Dr. Boursier, uh, who's joining us today from France. How was my French, my French accent there? Was it? Oh, so -so? <laughs> Magnifique, David. <laughs> uh, uh, Thank you for uh, inviting me to participate in this uh, sharing forum. Uh, I want to ask you a couple of questions before I start. Do you like to smile when you wake up? I know David, yes, and most of us, yes. Do, do you like within your day to overcome some challenges? I know, yes. Do you like to share these challenges? And if you don't have the answer, to ask the other people to help you to solve the problems you are facing? Yes. And this is my introduction to this uh, presentation. Uh, it is uh, linked, of course, to COVID pandemic, the challenges, innovations in adapted physical activities with glances from France. But when people ask me, where are you from? Uh, I am from fontenay maubeuge close to Paris, but I am from Europe, I am from the world, I am from the galaxy. And uh, I am with everyone. And so the COVID pandemic, uh, of course, changed our ways to imagine the way we um, provide, we share 
physical activities and adapted physical activities for all people that we share their lives with. Please, next slide. So I considered uh, many challenges that uh, happened uh, during COVID, people with disabilities, but I didn't want to only focus if, even if it is the Global Disability Summit, I wanted also to open the wings for the people who face long-term illnesses, LTI. And uh, so most of the special schools, institutions, hospitals were closed in France and in many countries with a lack of pedagogical support and follow-up programs for the, because of lockdown. And uh, many kids, uh, because of COVID, uh, many rooms uh, were um, in France open for the people uh, facing COVID. So some children uh, or people who were not too sick, I would say <laughs> like this, had to go back home. Uh, but the, the, sometimes uh, at home there was a lack of space, of uh, equipment. The families and the children faced loneliness and uh, faced sedentarity. And there was a very strong, strong, strong impact on the families. I don't talk about children uh, or adolescents or adults or elderly with a disability or long-term illness. But when you have a lockdown that has an enormous impact on the families, uh, because uh, the families, the, the parents, they have to, to work remotely and taking care of their uh, children or sometimes the adults. It depends on the age and without any pedagogical support nor uh, financial support. And all of them were in France living in diverse living conditions, either in uh, big cities, no transportation, if you don't wear a mask, and either no transportation. Wearing a mask when you are accompanying a person with intellectual disability, for example, he, he or she doesn't recognize you. It is a big problem. Living in diverse condition, that means that may sometimes there was no space to provide physical activities. And uh, one of the solution, of course, and it was said that was the use of uh, new technologies to access to online uh, APA programs. But many families, they don't know how to use these. The, for the professionals, uh, most in France, institutions, gyms, sport clubs were closed and uh, they didn't know how to use the new technologies to provide quality physical uh, activities for people with disabilities or even for everyone. And uh, there was a lack of pedagogical support for teaching online. For the national authorities, ha, 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 ha. in all our countries, I think it was <laughs> a, a very big challenge. They had to make decisions due to COVID uh, concerning lockdown, the vaccine, the continuity of services, uh, the economy, the health system, everything, everything. Uh, it was a nightmare. It is still a nightmare. And, uh, they found some solutions linked to associations and federations and NGOs. And I have a specific concern on the students because the universities were closed. They had some remote uh, courses, but uh, no way to practice sport or physical activities. And the future teachers, they need to have this kind of practice and they lived in poor living conditions and faced loneliness, which was a very big uh, concern. Next, time is running. <laughs> uh, so what we um, uh, imagined uh, uh, during COVID is to organize uh, physio-move teacher trainings, both for professionals and students 
allowing them to be able to uh, propose APAs sessions, uh, taking into consideration um, pedagogical issues and security and uh, follow-up programs. And we elaborated a sabbatic platform because the network during the COVID situation, all the professional students were alone. We needed to make some connections. So we organized some uh, online trainings and webinars uh, with the UFIT from UNESCO uh, online trainings and certification because um, inclusion is excellent. And we organized some training sessions with adults with intellectual disabilities with our students and professionals. Next slide. I need to rush. <laughs> and the families, where is the first place of inclusion? You have chosen maybe to work with people with disabilities or illness, but the families didn't. They face, they enjoy, but sometimes they struggle. So we imagine some supervised visual move uh, APA programs at home. You can see a, a picture. Uh, I tell this for Anamete. It's a father who is a uh, uh, playing with his uh, son with a disability uh, on the floor, and they are playing with their uh, their feet, and they have a ball that they have to, to jump with. And also we organize the sapati games, which are dedicated for uh, children with uh, illnesses or uh, disabilities that are online. And also we have during COVID elaborated more than 400 different games that can be accessible for uh, children with people with disabilities or illnesses, face-to-face -face or online. Next slide. The national and local authorities uh, in, in France, there is, a, thanks to COVID, <laughs> Who is saying thanks to COVID? Uh, there was a, a recent law on sport and health. Medical doctors now, they can prescribe uh, adapted physical activity programs for people with long-term uh, illnesses, uh, which is not so far uh, open to people with disabilities. So we have a petition to open this uh, law for people with disabilities. And they implemented many initiatives uh, in different ministries to um, develop inclusive uh, physical activities and programs for people with disabilities and illnesses. Because Paris 24, Olympic, Paralympic, uh, we have this chance in France to think about the heritage of the game. Next slide. I will be very short. We have some perspective and the perspective we need to share all together. And we can develop many programs, many initiatives that we have been working on, like stay active, uh, like the advocacy. And this is a, a, a question for you, David. Uh, minutes seven, we need all of us to be uh, committed to participate and providing some ideas and perspective for the Minix 7 with XP and other organizations. Thank you. I was too long uh, otherwise. <laughs> Thank you, Claire. Very well spoken. Um, Peter, I saw your note about your internet uh, challenges. Are you able to hear me now? If we if we went to you right now, would you be able to present now? I can see your name, but I can't see you on video. Peter, can you hear me? Peter Bukala? Okay, so this is what I'll do. Um, so Peter, if you get internet access and you get good Wi-Fi, just send me a message in the chat function 
and I'll let you go whenever you've got strong Wi-Fi. But in the meantime, Homa, can we start with your presentation now then? And then we'll continue and we'll, we'll perhaps, when Peter joins us, we'll then skip to Peter. Yes, oh, sure. Wait, I'm seeing a video of him. Hang on. Peter, can you hear me? I can't hear you. So it may be, no, is it in the bottom left or at the top, I think on this platform, the mute is on the top. Okay. Left. I'm here. Oh, hey, hey. Can you hear me? Peter, I can hear you. So I'm gonna to skip to your slides. Oh, okay. Homer, thank you. Thank you for your patience. Um, so let me just do that. Okay, so people just close your eyes for a second. I'm gonna skip ahead with the slides so I don't have to come back off and on to do that. So just hang on a second here. We're gonna skip ahead. How is this for adapting on the fly? Oh, wait, no, wait, wait, wait. It's not, there we go. Is the last one, is the last one. There it is. Peter, yeah. we got gotcha. you. There we go, there we go. Uh, uh, thank you, David. Can I go, can you hear me? Yes, Peter, I can hear you. Welcome, You're, where are you joining us from this morning? Where are you right now? Uh, I'm joining you from South Africa. Excellent. Well, thank you for- uh, I had come for a benchmarking. Uh, so let me go, let me go before it goes off. Go. Okay, my name is Peter Bukhala. I'm a, an associate professor at Masinda Muliro University of Science and Technology in Kenya. And I will be presenting a few slides on adapted physical activity in the post-COVID era in Kenya. Next. Are you able to? Okay. Uh, I want to start here where I'll say that Kenya confirmed his first case of COVID-19 uh, in March 2020. And these cases were mainly in uh, big cities but later on they spread to other counties and now we have cases reported in every part of uh, the country next uh, the next one okay yes uh, one of them is physical and uh, psychological uh, you move forward just move back um you moved one, one slide, yeah. More, these, these cases um, led to physical and psychological health risks, uh, widespread job and income losses, and family confinement in isolation and economic, and those with economic vulnerability are more exposed. So what we're seeing here is that uh, when, when COVID struck, families had a lot of challenges and these were both psychological and physical. Next. Uh, to curb this, uh, the government uh, decided to close all schools, uh, including higher learning institutions. And there were, therefore, in terms of sports, there was no access to sports activities uh, because the, the country uh, government decided that no physical activities no sporting activities will take place until very, very recently is when they opened up uh, sporting activities. And then there was no access to trainers because again, the next one, next one, David. Yeah. Now, the Kenya government strategy, they came up with three strategies. The first one, oh, you moved fast. Oh, sorry, I'll go back. Uh, the Kenya government came up with three, yeah. came up with three strategies. And the first one is uh, to ensure that everybody adhere to the guidance for social distancing. And when they talk about social distancing, it meant that uh, people with disabilities who rely on others for support, this was curtailed. Uh, quarantine and self-isolation, again, for those with disabilities, it meant that they could not be in uh, public and therefore to protect them, they were isolated and therefore uh, stayed indoors, many of them. Uh, the government also uh, developed online content 
to ensure an interrupted learning for those with the those who are in schools, those in primary, those in secondary, they started introducing uh, online teaching. But unfortunately, again, this online teaching was not, go to the next one. Uh, unfortunately for this online teaching, it did not uh, go well because many of the children in remote areas were not able, were not able to access even online. Uh, there are reports to show that only about 20% of all the children who are in school accessed uh, online teaching. Now, when it came to those with the, those who are participating in physical activities, we all know that physical activities requires presence of uh, support for direction and so forth. And uh, when you say now online teaching, this did not augur well in terms of whether it was going to work for them. And I remember uh, Special Olympics introduced what they called uh, Special Olympics online learning portal where uh, they were expecting that uh, children would, could access online videos and then practice these activities at home. Again, because majority of people with disabilities in Kenya live in rural areas, they were not able to access this online uh, teaching. So it became a cropper and therefore no activities happen. Next. Uh, the next one. So we can see the lockdown and prolonged institutional closures have had long term ramifications, even now. Those whose families, for example, lost jobs, those who are living in town and had moved with their children with disabilities to access schooling in towns had to relocate back to their villages. And when they relocate back to their villages, there was no opportunity for their young people with disabilities to participate. So loss of jobs, meaning families moving away from cities. And when they move away from the cities, the villages don't have schools, don't have facilities, don't have opportunities for those learners with disabilities. So COVID resulted in learners missing out on physical contact with teachers and peers for content delivery. In addition, they also missed out on opportunities to access facilities where they could improve on their physical activity uh, skill level. Next. Uh, so prolonged closures again resulted in stress among parents and guardians as provision of childcare uh, became a challenge. And many of the parents with children with disabilities rely on schools, schools to take of their children for almost three, three quarters of the year because they close only one, one month in three months. And that means the children are at home for only three months and parents who are poor can afford that. But now you can imagine for two years, all these children were at home. So it became a stress for parents and guardians to provide for their children at home because they do not have the facilities, the equipment or the knowledge, the know-how in terms of how to take care of their children with disabilities. In the absence of substitute options, employed parents frequently leave learners on their own. So parents who are unemployed or they're employed, they, are, they have to go to work. But when schools are open, the children are taken care of in school but now they are at home. So when the parents are not there, they leave their children unattended and sometimes with caregivers who are not trained, who are not competent. And as a result, we've had cases of uh, hazardous behaviors being reported amongst uh, young people with disabilities or people taking advantage of them. And now we have even cases of children uh, being impregnated for when they are left at home with the people who are close to them, but uh, the parent cannot do anything. They have to leave their children. And in the process, uh, we see uh, behaviors changing. We see actions on the children that are not very good. So closure of schools compounded with the restricted movements among poor households have led to retrogression in skills. And this is important to note. When the children came back home, uh, those with disabilities and with the lack of continuing skill development, majority of them are noted to have re 
retro retrogressed. Uh, and this could be seen in terms of uh, some of the teachers when I interviewed them. They told me our children have come back, but they are not uh, performing well. All the skills we taught them have disappeared. We have to start afresh. And this has been a challenge to schools and even in terms of um, a progression in skill development. Next. So, so in Kenya, we, as I said, schools play a significant uh, part in social protection because the uh, schools provide for children safe haven, a place where the children from poor and vulnerable communities can uh, get food, they can get uh, uh, support from schools and even people who support them can bring to the school. But when they closed, even simple uh, facilities, simple equipment, simple uh, materials that were given by government were stopped. So you can imagine now in terms of um, uh, young girls who are like uh, 12, 13 years have no access to sanitary pads which are provided free by the, by the government. But when they closed, nothing was happening. So in terms of learning, in terms of teacher uh, support, it was not there. In terms of peer support, it was not there. And this has just happened until very recently when schools have now opened and uh, children are now back in school. When institutions close, parents are supposed to enable the learning of the children at home. But many of our parents with children with disabilities do not have the skills, are not knowledgeable, and many times they are not able to provide support to their children. They rely on teachers and now the teachers are not there. So you find parents are finding it difficult and that's why I said you will find a stress because they are not sure how to take care of their, their parents. Next. So again, one of the things we have noted since uh, COVID is that quite a number of young people with disabilities have dropped from school, they have dropped from sports activities, they are now, they have to be, the important one is that they have dropped out of school. And I said the other time, when parents relocate from their usual place where they took their children to school, you due to job loss, you find that where they are moving to, they are likely not to have schools for the children that they have with disabilities. So if you start counting how many children with disabilities have now dropped out of school because of just this issue of parents relocating, it's many, many of them. So schools are reporting that not all children who were, who were enrolled in these special schools or uh, integrated schools have not reported back. Uh, we have also cases where it has been reported quite a number of the young people are pregnant. Uh, they have dropped out because of pregnancies. And then also because parents are not working, there's a lot of financial constraints and parents are finding it difficult to take back their children with disabilities. So they are just at home. And uh, this has become a challenge to the government's effort to have every child in school, every child transiting from one class to the other, a number of them have not gone because of the challenges of finance, because of the challenges of parents relocating, and because of challenges of young people with the disabilities being impregnated in their communities. Next. Next one. Okay. Uh, this is the last uh, part I wanted to talk about in terms of competitive sports. Uh, for the last two years running, no curricular activities were taking place. And therefore we never, for example, for school calendar, there were no sports uh, for two years. And you know, in schools, every school will have their, uh, their pupils go to practice. They will give them practice sessions because they want them to compete in uh, school games. Now, when there are no school games, you find that teachers have no interest in having the children to come back to school to train, even when it was closed. So we now see many of the co-curricular activities were all stopped. The, the government calendar for sports was stopped. So we have not had uh, competitions for 
uh, schools, uh, 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 games, activities, uh, especially for those with the disabilities, they all were stopped and uh, no competitions have gone on. Uh, this was because also you see closure of gyms, stadiums, uh, dance uh, studios and so forth. All these places were closed and no competition has. And, and the effect of this is now being felt. For example, last year when we had the, was it last year or the other year? Last year when we had the uh, Paralympic Games, we actually reduced the number of people participating in the Paralympic Games. And the reason is very many of the ones who are potentially in 2020 or 2019 who had shown that they had met the required uh, mark, they all retrogressed. So the government could only take a few, a few of those who still had uh, qualified. Uh, we had very few people and uh, for the first time, development of Paralympic teams in Kenya, that we have only, we only managed to score uh, a, a bronze. You can imagine the other Olympics, we had the winners in athletics, uh, the, the middle and long distances, but this time in practicing, they have not had the chance to practice at the level expected uh, for a longer time, and and as a result, uh, our performance even at national level uh, among teachers and learners to practice, uh, even those who are out of school, there's no motivation because of this uh, situation. And you can see now what, what I'm. Peter, I think I've just lost you right at the very end of your presentation. Um, so the internet, I think, was starting to, to, to come out right at the end there. If you can still hear me, uh, I want you to know that I very much appreciate you doing this. And I was glad to be able to sneak in uh, while the internet was still good. So thank you very much for your presentation. So Homa, are you ready now? And what I'll do is I'll go back and I'll get to your slide deck. So again, close your eyes. And we'll do exactly that. Here we go. Going backwards in time. Let me see what happened. And we are almost there. And there we are. Yeah. Homa, over to you. Thank you for your patience. Uh, thank you to everyone who fought through the internet glitches. That is one of the challenges with these online uh, platforms and particularly from a global scale. And I was glad that we were able to sneak Peter in. So over to you, Homa, in my own country of Canada right here, and you're just down the road for me actually. Uh, so thank you for joining us. Thank you so much, David. I'm Homa Rafi Minajadi, a PhD in sports sciences from Iran. Uh, but now I'm postdoc in Canada at the University of Calgary. I'm so much happy to be here. Thank you to Dr. Lake to invite me for giving this presentation on the findings of my survey on innovative ideas to deliver programming under COVID restrictions for people with autism. So as I mentioned, I'm a postdoc at the University of Calgary working with Dr. Larry Cates at the Sport Technology Research Lab. I'm, my field of study is how to improve physical activity for people, uh, children, adolescents, and adults for, uh, with uh, autism spectrum disorder. And my postdoc is funded by uh, Autism Spectrum autism Friendship Society, which is a, um, an institution. I will explain it more in next slides. Thank you. Uh, to talk about autism and the core symptoms, um, you may have heard that uh, uh, having deficiencies in the social and interaction skills and having repetitive and uh, restricted, restricted patterns of behaviors and interests are core symptoms for people in the spectrum. Also, motor deficiencies are uh, significant problems for these people, and some studies have suggested that uh, these motor problems can be considered as core symptoms for these people. 
further to further to other uh, symptoms that I talked about, uh, there are some psychiatric comorbidities for these people, including having mood, mood disorders, anxiety, depression, and behavioral problems. And uh, unfortunately, next slide, please. All of these problems starting COVID and the lockdown is exacerbated for people with autism. They had to stay at home. They lost all, all their social connections and social networks. They couldn't have access to in-person therapies, uh, therapies and uh, programs and uh, all the uncertainty around COVID and, and uh, the idea that what they didn't know what is going to happen uh, increased their anxiety. Also, they had to stay at, for some people, a small houses and uh, live with their families, have uh, education at home, and all the financial burden of uh, the unemployment in family also uh, increased all the challenges for people uh, with autism. So this uh, also was so, can we go to the next slide? <laughs> This condition also increased, uh, like caused a lot of challenges for uh, institutions and um, centers who provide services for people with autism. Like for example, for autism, uh, Asperger Friendship Society uh, that I'm working with, uh, they provide so, uh, social, physical activity, recreational programs for uh, people with autism in all the age ranges and their mission is friendship. They uh, started, uh, uh, starting this uh, COVID and lockdown, lockdown stopped a lot of uh, all of their programs at first and uh, caused a lot of uh, struggles and uh, um, problems for uh, providing services for people, for their clients, for them. Also, uh, another institution that I have, been, can, yeah, can we go to the next slide? Also, another institution in, based in Manitoba, uh, it's called Gaining Resources Our Way. Uh, they also provide uh, life skill programs, uh, including physical activity programs for people with autism. They, all, they also uh, uh, face a lot of challenges because they lost all the uh, in-person in connection with their clients. So it's, they started to think about how they can connect to people and thank to technology, can you, can you please go to the next slide, David? Thank you, technology that opened the window of uh, like being connected to people for uh, these institutions like Apps and Grow to get connected to their clients. But uh, getting connected through virtual uh, platforms and online tools uh, had some challenges for them because they, they didn't know how to get connected through these tools. So um, maybe some of their clients lost their programs because they, they were not able to connect through Zoom and uh, they didn't get their needs uh, because compared to before COVID, they used to have this in-person connection, a lot of care, a lot of guidance, a lot of connection with their uh, instructors and the program leaders, and they, 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 all, they lost all of them. Also for leaders and the staff, it was so difficult to uh, give guidance and provide cues for them to uh, run their programs, uh, but they started to uh, like feel and think uh, creatively about all the things that has happened. Uh, uh, in addition to all the uh, uncertainty and challenges using technology, uh, like all the disconnections and freezing using technology was another problem for them. Uh, but uh, yeah, they started to think uh, like they started to be so, um, creative and uh, think about new ways of uh, how, to, uh, how to be able to provide better services for clients with autism. I heard from all of the leaders and the staff of these organizations that they have been connecting to the families and the people with autism, and uh, they have been trying to provide video and audio consultation for them to uh, help them like um, adapt to the changes and this, this break in their uh, routine lifestyle. They also started to decrease the capacity of the online programs. They started to change the 
um, programs and uh, divide people to different days. And uh, one thing that was so important for them, it, it was uh, prioritizing clients' need over like learning and anything else that is uh, happening at that moment. Next slide, please. Yeah, they started to think about uh, how, how we can get more connected to them and how we can provide more fun and enjoy, enjoyable time for, for them. Uh, I heard that they have been mailing stuff, games, uh, ingredients for cooking to their houses. And they had they tried to make this uh, video Zoom time so fun and uh, enjoyable for them. They had some guests over every session. and. That guest that was a, a stand-up comedian or a pilot or any uh, like uh, this kind of persons uh, to, uh, to to create to create a fun time for them. And uh, I mentioned kind of that that they prioritized enjoyment over everything, and they paid so much attention to these socializations during this time of having the online uh, connection. Online uh, connection. Uh, the same also happened for physical activity and sports programs, uh, especially through apps. They uh, started to think about uh, which kind of uh, sport programs we can transfer to online format, like boxing, stepping out, which is a kind of fitness program, yoga, dance, physical literacy. And they started to uh, think uh, uh, which uh, games can be played online. They uh, think about uh, creative and new uh, style of games. They were so patient to the uh, clients when they turn off their camera. They were so uh, uh, creative in giving social, key, uh, like uh, visual cues to them. And uh, for clients with autism, using this visual instruction and uh, looking at what is happening in the uh, in their uh, like screen was a, a good point actually. And uh, after some time, gradually, they started to uh, like perform uh, every movement better, but still apps or, uh, paid more attention to the fun time they are having, not uh, like, for example, when they uh, had boxing program, they didn't pay attention to how much courage they are performing that movement, rather than they, they, they paid more attention to uh, like just uh, moving their body and have at least that uh, activity time. Yeah, and it was so nice for clients with autism. They they uh, adapted themselves themselves to this uh, online format. Started to express their needs, their uh, emotions for giving for receiving feedback, uh, hug and high five. They uh, increased their uh, on time on task time, and they showed more more involvement and engagement in the programs in the online format programs. Can we go to the next slide? Uh, yeah, uh, for apps, also using a, a kind of new um, uh, tool, which is called Remo, was uh, also innovative. Uh, Remo is a, a tool that can host up to 1,000 users at the same time, uh, and it has some floors. It's good for having events and this kind of uh, networking uh, activities. People can go uh, in this uh, platform, people can go table to table and talk with each other. They can choose wherever when, uh, where they, they can go and talk, talk to people they would like. I wish I had one picture of this uh, tool, that, but I forgot to add that picture. So the Telero is another app that has been using by other organizations. It uh, makes possible uh, that health professionals like uh, psychologists, physicians to get connected to their clients. And uh, it's, it can be used uh, by a smartphone tablet. And it's been so useful during COVID that they were not able to have in-person appointments. 
And the last slide is about a study that we ran during, during COVID. It was a participatory design and we aimed to pro, uh, like present some applications for physical activity to, to adults with autism. We wanted to uh, make them aware of what, what is there for uh, them to use as uh, like a te technolog technological tools for them to use to be able to more sociable and active at the time of COVID. We presented that application to them and then we discussed what they liked and what they didn't, didn't like about this application, which was so nice. And we collected in like so nice information. Yeah, thank you so much. I uh, finished my presentation. Thank you, Homa. I very much enjoyed your presentation. Uh, and this is the first time I think you've spoken at an IFAPA event. So welcome, by the way. Uh, our next speaker, we got two more left. So now we're going to crisscross again the Atlantic. We're going to go to Finland, and then we're going to finish with Omar in Jordan. Kwok, over to you. Thank you, David. Um, thank you, everyone, for uh, hanging on in here and uh, everybody present in, for this event. So, uh, um, yeah, much appreciated for your, for your attention during this time. Uh, so this presentation is based on some data we collected pretty much in the early stages of the pandemic around about April, May, June um, of 2020. Um, and we're basically the, the, the bottom line is if you don't want to pay attention to any more that I'm going to say, it's that we need to accelerate the 21st century skills for adaptive physical educators. And there's lots of reasons of what have already been mentioned of um, the efficacy and the competencies that are needed from there. Um, my name is Kwok. I'm uh, affiliated at University of Eastern Finland and University of Limerick. I'm also the vice president of both uh, UFAPA, which is the European Federation of Adaptive Physical Activity, as well as the International Federation of Adaptive Physical Activity. Next slide, please. So uh, just um, uh, one of the key documents that have um, helped us with the um, the understanding of physical education during the COVID-19 lockdowns have been reiterated from all the other colleagues earlier on is this uh, need of, um, of, of physical education provision and that the digital divide in terms of what had happened when we were turning things into an online situation um, was, was very much lacking. And um, this required a lot of the things around information communication technology, and, uh, and it was around in different formats as well, like on online radio and television based. Uh, next slide, please. So I'd like to present you with one model that we use at the University of Eastern Finland and across the world, actually. It's, it's, called, it's called a TPAC model, and it combines a combination of technology, content, pedagogy, and knowledge and the combination of all, of all of that. And that's what's presented in this figure on the right-hand side with three Venn diagrams, well, sorry, three circles overlapping each other in a Venn diagram, just to show that there are seven levels of interaction. And they are uh, uh, TK, CK, and PK, with K meaning knowledge, and then T, C, P being technology, content, and pedagogy. Uh, next slide, please. So in our study, we uh, collected data from all around Europe, at the, as I said, at quite early on in terms of the pandemic, and particularly at the times when um, there were lockdowns in place. In pretty much all the countries we collected data in, there were lockdowns in terms of there was remote schooling taking place. We asked for teachers that were in, um, uh, who specialize adaptive physical education teachers, or at least education teachers uh, in, in direct relation with children with disabilities. We managed to recruit 125 teachers, uh, mainly uh, uh, a few more female than male, and the spread of countries were from France, Ireland, Latvia, Lithuania, Portugal, Romania, the United Kingdom, and Ukraine. And um, as mentioned earlier, there are many children with disabilities that go into the general schools, so this was 60% of the teachers were teaching general schools, but yet there are still some areas in Europe where there are special classes or special schools, and that covered about 40% of our sample. We also asked them about their age, and we had uh, the most popular age was between 40 to 49 year olds, 
and we asked them about their level of experience in teaching either in physical education or in uh, working with children with disabilities and what we have here is, is that most of them were from intermediate to expert levels. Next slide please. So here's the paper we published um, earlier uh, in, in the beginning of 2021, so that's uh, almost a year ago now, and you can find uh, more details about that from this paper which is open access in a special issue in the European Journal of Special Needs Education. We also have the website on the UFAPA website that gives various links in relation to adaptive physical education and COVID-19. And the uh, URL address is ufapa.eu forward slash ufapa uh, forward slash pe hyphen and hyphen sen hyphen during hyphen COVID hyphen 19. So what we found from the results was when we looked at the different levels of knowledge based on TPAC from these physical educators, that the novice teacher had this lowest level of content knowledge in terms of being able to deliver physical education. And this is expected as in terms of the, uh, they have less experience in teaching physical education. Um, however, when we looked at the intermediate um, teachers, there seemed to be a reduction from, uh, in comparison to uh, the expert teachers in the pedagogical content knowledge, the technological content knowledge. So that means using their technology as they are uh, to teach with their content. So for example, if we're looking at, uh, let's just say kicking a, playing football as a, as a sport, um, they, they, the use of the technology to teach kicking a football or, or using football um, was less known by these teachers. But even with an expert teacher, they had some uh, content knowledge based on a technology. And when you combine all of it together, this is the technology, the pedagogical knowledge um, and the content knowledge. Again, it was really only the expert teachers that were demonstrating um, some levels of, of, of abilities to do this. And as we saw, the majority of teachers were either intermediate or novice teachers. So therefore, this might give reasons for why we see this gap in the physical literacy, we might see the gap in terms of um, getting people out and about, the rise in obesity, and, uh, and many other issues that have been raised by my colleagues earlier today. Uh, next slide, please. So what we did was, as part of this paper, we also updated our European standards in adaptive physical activity. Now, the USAPA, which is the, the standards, we have three different areas. We've got um, physical education, we have uh, rehabilitation, and we have sports. So part of the data we, we used from this area of using a TPAC, as well as with efficacy, as well as intentions, we were able to identify areas that needed to be added to the functional map of the USAPA. So what we, we looked at as the, with a team of authors, uh, areas of the USAPA that needed additional work um, based on the uh, low levels of, of TPAC. We then identified certain areas where we needed to add the technology component to the USAPA, and then after setting the standard of what we felt was necessary and needed to be able to use this as a standard going forwards for um, providing uh, qualifications for adaptive physical educators. And then uh, we updated the standards of which you can have uh, free access to this again, also from which is on the uh, Open Science Framework website. So that's osf.io forward slash hb4xr. Uh, it's also available on the UFAPA website under that page I mentioned earlier. And also we, we have demonstrated how much of the TPAC influence uh, had on these updated standards. So that was the second purpose of this study, to update our initial standards on adaptive physical education. And next slide, please. So as a result of this, so now we've done this groundwork, we now have uh, an opportunity to put forward these standards in this uh, new project that's just started. It's called the Send I Teach. It's focusing on providing um, uh, inclusive physical education to primary school teachers. It is a co-funded project by Erasmus Plus, uh, it's coordinated by the Lithuanian Sports University. I see some of my colleagues are on this call at the moment. And, um, and I would say that this was an opportunity to put some of our work in practice 
to see how we go forwards as we look, hopefully look to move out from this uh, COVID pandemic. I'd also like to um, invite you all to the opportunity to take part in the European Conference in Physical Activity, uh, a conference in Adaptive Physical Activity, that's UCAPA 2022, which we held this summer in Coimbra, um, in Portugal. They are still, uh, they are allowing late breaking abstracts now, and it's the abstracts are still uh, now available, and it will close on the 30th of March. So if you're a researcher and you're interested, in uh, sharing some of your work, disseminating work, or um, listening to others uh, with their work, um, please consider uh, attending that conference there. Um, thank you very much, David. I think that's uh, a wrap from me. Thank you. You are most welcome. And I just found out that my abstract was accepted for UCAPA in Portugal. And I know Homa is going to submit one too, uh, to attend. Well, so I look forward to meeting you all there. And uh, yes, that will be excellent uh, excellent opportunity to discuss these things further awesome thank you Clark. our final speaker of the eight thank you for everybody's patience omar thank you for kind of batting clean up here to use the baseball analogy is dr homer uh, omar hindawi from jordan omar over to you you're on mute still we had you earlier let's see Oh. Yes. Okay. Now you can hear me now. Yes, we can. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you, David. First of all, it's my great pleasure to be with all of you in a global disability summit uh, for this uh, session about adapted physical education post COVID-19 from a global perspective. Actually, uh, one of our study during COVID-19, which is training during the COVID-19 lockdown we focus on three elements, which is uh, knowledge, beliefs, and the practices of persons with disability. Uh, I'm uh, from Hashemite University uh, in Jordan uh, in health and the human performance, specialized in adapted physical uh, activity. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so we will focus on uh, many things in this uh, study which is impact of public health measured on athletes of persons with disability and this understanding how public health measures influence athletes with disability may help better prepare sports, medicine and sports support teams of similar uh, situations in the future. Uh, also how knowledge and beliefs versus attitudes of persons with disability were characterized on both COVID-19 training practices. And for these reasons, we characterized the athletes' knowledge and beliefs or attitudes related to training disruptions and the practices during the COVID-19 lockdown in the Paralympic athletes sample, including comparison between athletes classification, such as world class, national, and the state level athletes. Next slide, please. Training does uplift classification of athletes to a higher level. Higher classification athletes with disability have superior knowledge and beliefs regarding training. Also, these were ranked as moderate, suggesting that training related evidence may not denigrate all these athletes to a good level. Lack of resources and multidisciplinary support teams acquired persons with disability and their lockdown deprived from the connectivity with the world. During the lockdown, both athletes trained alone and focused on general health and well-being rather than with sport, partly because of a lack of resource, such as space, equipment, facilities, multidisciplinary support teams, with such access to favor higher classification athletes. Isolative lockdown of persons with disability distant them uh, from motivational involvement. The challenge athletes experienced during lockdown reduced their motivation, which was amplified 
by the lack of competition, athletes or coaches may benefit from a management that permit training and competition during lockdown, even if home-based. Substantial reduction in key training variables were generally observed among most of athletes' classification. Although higher classification athletes, COVID better in general, all athletes reported including frequency during intensity and the tube. Next slide, please. Remote based practices using digital mediated technology for coaching, training, emerged appeared effective and were best received by higher classification athletes. The rise of online instructor and directive training improved knowledge and beliefs versus attitude. Information resources such as easily accessible online seminar and discussion are necessarily for athletes to improve knowledge and belief versus attitude. Next slide, please. For intellectual disability, and we take this example about Down syndrome, motivation retreat due to lack of parents training qualification kept persons with disability less suburb, uh, supervised. Lack of motivation during lockdown was one of the main challenge that children faced. Moreover, their parents or guides were not qualified to plan the run their children physical activity sessions. As it was reported by the parents, children were not motivated to train by their own. Next slide, please. So regarding to these things, I have two recommendations, which is talking about qualitative connectivity is the key of success of training objectives when uh, your guns and servos expectations. Also, the second recommendation, ongoing expectancy of badmin urgency inference, the need to restructuring of training process value, the practice and objectives. That's all I have. Thank you so much. Thank you all. Here I am chatting away <laughs> and myself on mute. My God, it's, it's, only been, it's, okay. it's only been two years since we started doing this and I still haven't figured it out. Um, <laughs> thank you, Omar. Um, let me get to our final slides here. Holy cow, when is this pandemic gonna end? Um, thank you so very much to our eight speakers. We crisscrossed the globe. We had perspectives on adapted physical education from a variety of perspectives, although many of the messages were, were similar, weren't they? That the, this pandemic has had a considerable impact on individuals, regardless of impairment and disability, but particularly for children in an adapted physical education context, there have been uh, significant challenges. But going back to you know even Enemeta at the very start, there have been some, some opportunities that have been presented as well. Um, for perhaps some positive developments that last longer. Um, we do have opportunity uh, for questions. If, if uh, members of our audience do want to ask, you can either use the chat or you can unmute yourself and ask directly to the collective and or specific speakers. And I would be remiss if I did not uh, suggest that if you wanted to continue to follow up on this type of conversation, um, that you connect with our website, ifapa.net. Um, we're also uh, on social media on uh, Twitter and Facebook, and so I would encourage you to uh, to look us up and and uh, and consider continuing this conversation with us. And as as Kwok mentioned, um, the, the European Association will be hosting their conference this summer in June in in Portugal. Our other regional associations, and by the way, I should point out that Dr. Hindawi is the the founder of the, of the most recent regional association uh, in the Middle East. And congratulations to, to Dr. Hindawi for starting that. 
We will also have regional conferences in, in Asia. The Asian Association will be hosted in Hong Kong in August and North America Federation of Adaptive Physical Activity will be hosted uh, in October in uh, St. Catharines, which is right near Niagara Falls, uh, Canada. And uh, Sarah, I can't recall the, the other newest uh, regional association is in South America. And I do seem to recall that there's going to be a, a conference there, but off the top of my head, I am, I'm remiss at not being able to remember where that is. The Brazilian Association to have the conference in April. Very good. Thank you very much, Cyril. So with that, uh, again, I open it up for any uh, questions, comments, conversation and, and by all means you're you're free to use the chat function and or to unmute yourself and ask directly are there any questions or comments i don't have any question i just want to thank you for this opportunity i so much enjoyed like being up get, being updated of what has been happening during uh, all around the world during covid thank you you are most welcome, Homa, and I know you've been introduced to Omar, being an Iranian yes. uh, citizen, so I know you've we connected. We will work with... together next month, sure, sure. <laughs> Fantastic. And really, wow. this, this, this very much is, is a part of our goal of IFAPA, and these types of yes. interactions is to develop relationships and contacts and then connections uh, for further investigations, for the programs, and for further services. Are there any other comments or questions from our audience? Having taught online for the last two years, I'm familiar with this process of waiting for questions. Having seen none, and I know we've kept you for a little over an hour and a half. And so I, again, I want to express my sincere gratitude for your patience and your willingness to engage with us. Um, thank you uh, for those of you in attendance. Thank you so much to our uh, eight speakers. I have shared my direct email address if uh, individuals who are listening in want to engage with other speakers. I'm happy to uh, provide those introductions to you. I've also uh, provided IFAPA's website there, and I would certainly encourage you to engage with us um, and connect and, and allow us to, to know how we can be of service uh, to you across the globe. So unless there are any further comments or questions, I will remain on um, until everyone has logged off. Uh, I wish you, I wish you good day, uh, wherever you are and Kwok, I see you have your hand up. You have one final comment you wish to make. I'd actually like to ask a question if that's possible. Oh, okay. Yeah. I mean, so you get the bonus marks, you get the bonus <laughs> participation marks that I would have given out as an instructor then right there. Thank you. Thank you. I'd, uh, I'll get extra merits on, on this. Sure. Yeah. Um, I suppose whoever wants to answer this question particularly in the different regions that will be really nice to hear from you so in Europe we've set these standards for adaptive physical activity and we did this for the purpose of trying to um, standardize a set of competencies that we would try to have for our adaptive physical educators and and sports and rehabilitation so I wonder if this kind of work would be usable in other regions whether you could see that this type of work could become more uh, more global. Um, so who would like to answer that question? Maybe someone not in Europe. So I would I would open this up to, you know, to Omar um, or Ciro in from South America, Rosa in Turkey, Homa in Canada. Kwok, you may want to, can you restate the question just so that we're more clear perhaps on what yeah, it is so, you're asking? So we have a set of, stand, we built a set of standards in 2010 on adaptive physical activity to have um, kind of equal set of, minimal set of competencies for, uh, for people to work in adaptive physical activity. So um, what I'm wondering is, is whether you would see this type of work useful 
in your regions, part of your regions that are work. And so if we say, start to say yes to this, then whether that would become a more global set of standards where we could try to work towards a, a common, common set of competencies needed for, for our field. I, I mean, I'll, I'll answer from a North American perspective. Canada and the United States are quite different in our approaches to adaptive physical activity. And in part, it's because the United States has adapted physical education as a recognized profession. Um, and so adapted physical educators have specific criteria, you know, similar to, I think, what you're identifying, whereas in Canada, we don't. Um, and so I guess where I, I see potential challenges is trying to accommodate all the different national and regional contextual issues, although that doesn't necessarily mean so that, so it, it, I think it would be difficult to compare apples to apples um, if, you, if you went on a global scale, in part because of the designation of professionals, but also the educational systems and platforms that people would typically use. However, having said that, I don't think it's an inappropriate pursuit to try to come up with a global understanding of what the skills and attributes are of excellence within adapted physical activity and adapted physical education. So Claire, I see your hand up, although you're from, you're from Europe and Quok asked not to have a- uh, so, so, so I close my mouth. But the, the problem is the same in uh, many countries in Europe where uh, adaptive physical activity professionals are not uh, always uh, recognized. And uh, this is why on my slides, I added uh, a specific thing uh, about uh, what is going right now is there was a law uh, allowing the medical doctors to prescribe physical activities uh, for people with uh, long-term illnesses and not for people with disabilities, we are fighting. And the ones who will provide this, uh, if you want uh, reimbursement uh, by the social security, are not APA professionals, but uh, physicians. And so we try to, uh, to play a little uh, piece uh, in our, uh, even in Europe, we face these kind of problems of the lack of recognition of uh, the APA professionals with uh, three or five years of studies, it is complicated. <laughs> now, yeah, I, see, I promise. I, I see. Um, I see that that Maria uh, from uh, Austria has agreed uh, with you, and even the the language challenge, um, insofar as standards. And then Christina, I, I just, I, I see her comment here and she, she wants to ask Rosa, could you comment on what content was brought uh, to the EBA platform for physical education teachers? Rosa, are you able to respond to that? Yes, yeah, thank you for the question. And uh, so in EBA platform, all the classes like physical education, mathematics, music, everything was created first as pre-recorded video. And then after uh, the first semester, which is the first lockdown period from 2020 spring semester, after that, uh, during the summer, we also had uh, online education continued uh, because the education was really disrupted. And then like, uh, this was how to say, like all these pre-recorded videos were uh, prepared according to what you have in your regular curriculum at school. If it's primary school in Turkey, we have movement and game, uh, not physical education. But then in elementary school, we have physical education and sports and uh, physical activity. And in high school, it's the physical education. So uh, the first, uh, it was all according to curriculum, but then because uh, we needed more uh, after school kind of activities. So more adapted and inclusive games and plays were added inside the content, if it's answering your question. And related to other topic, what Kork uh, asked, if I may go with uh, also short, uh, with this so uh, yeah so about the standards it's also it's a very good question and it's very good topic to focus maybe uh, in like 
as we are here. Uh, like in Turkey, uh, unfortunately, if you ask uh, from the APA or AP teacher uh, education, we have two universities who are providing, which is providing um, adapted physical education teacher training program for four years. Both of them are for four years, uh, four years study. But besides that, uh, all the AP or upper professionals uh, are coming uh, from the education, uh, from the regular PE and sports teacher training. Then you are having the courses or some uh, upper related, I don't know, programs if you attend or something. So like even somebody wrote, Maria wrote, uh, even the, um, language is problem, she says, and this is also an issue in Turkey. The terminology, the the the, the terms we use, the language we use. There is still some differences between different professors, different perspectives. But of course, these uh, issues uh, are never a problem. Shouldn't be a problem to start something new and to start something. Uh, to offer something better or to, as a solution, you know? So I just wanted to say, thank you. No, oh, yeah, good point, Rosa, thank you. Uh, Ciro, you had your hand up? David, I mean, in Brazil is fantastic. We have one line. The standards in Brazil is one line in the Brazilian regulation of physical education course. It's mandatory, period. Just <laughs> Done. <laughs> yeah, it's easy. And in Brazil, we have uh, universities and faculties, we have 1,043 course of physical education. And the regulation is one line. And yeah. Brazil, in South America, we don't have anything. So in that particular instance, because of the absence, then, then maybe there is an opportunity um, and with the language, you know, being Portuguese or Spanish, I mean, so it's somewhat homogeneous. Uh, there may be opportunities for to look at standards from a South American perspective. Uh, thank you, yes. sir. Any other questions or comments? If I may continue from yeah. this a little bit, they, we do have the standards in different languages, um, and I'm just putting in um, a couple of links about this. It was good work from different European colleagues. I wasn't part of it at the time, but I've certainly, we've had to work on it going forwards. And um, yeah, I mean, it's, it, 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 if it would, you know, it's freely available. So if you'd like to have a look at it and you'd like to have some um, further knowledge or further, work on this you know we'll, we'll be happy to, to to do that for sure you know we have it in portuguese in polish in latvian uh french and flemish and um of course it may not be perfect the updated version hasn't been updated into these other languages yet but this is the question do we have we got the possibility to do that um i don't know natalia has also worked on it I don't know whether she also wanted to mention. Well, she has raised her hand. Oh, she yes. oh, okay, okay, yes, she's here as well. Yeah, um, can you hear me? Yes, yeah. we can. Um, uh, I just want to say that uh, I was a part of this project and um, at the beginning, our idea was to build up three standards for three professions, including APA uh, experts. But then we realized that we are not ready for that because in uh, so many countries, uh, APA specialist is not recognized. And we said that even if we forced our university to open the bachelor or master program in APA, it's not fair for people because after this study program, we have no workplaces for them. So the idea of this standard was uh, to introduce important elements for physical therapists, physical uh, educators, uh, 
about APA, which should be included in the regular program. And I have to say that it was extremely useful in Poland because a few years ago, when we built up a five year study program for phys physiotherapists, uh, we forced ministry to include in standard of physiotherapy uh, study program, certain amount of uh, courses about APA and we re re recall the European standard. Yes, we said, well, it's a European standard. We're supposed to follow it. So um, I think maybe it's the, it's the, the way how we can uh, use this European standard in also in other countries, yes? Just to look for the content and um, include this recommended number of uh, ECTS. I don't remember, but what was exactly, but I think we, we recommended about uh, 20 or 30 ECTS about APA for different areas. Yeah, yeah, okay. Thank but, you, Natalia, and th thank you for participating in the conversation. Thank you. Kwok, thank you for raising the issue and the question. I appreciate it. Any final comments or questions from our audience? Anamita? Oh, Anamita, yes, sorry. Yeah, I just... Uh... Oh, we lost your... Oh, sorry, oh, sorry. Yeah. you're back. Uh, uh, I just want to thank everybody for joining. And I think it's been extremely interesting. And I think uh, from one of my points in the start, I'm not sure we had done made this happen before COVID. We didn't mm. wish for COVID, but we might as well take the best out of COVID. And <laughs> uh, I think this is a great opportunity. It's also for students, and I want to repeat, it's also for people that can't afford to travel or because of disability will not be able to attend conferences uh, for many, many reasons. So I hope this is tradition we will continue because I think it's a great opportunity. You just need internet access and you can take part. So thank you very much for all the interesting comments from everybody. You're most welcome and thank you for the comment, Anamet, then. I will say that moving forward, um, the International Symposium of Adapted Physical Activity, which is the International Conference of IFAPA, is partnering uh, actually with Dr. Boursier, who's with us today, uh, to make to ensure that our international conferences, so our next one is being held in 2023 in New Zealand, but we're partnering with a, an organization that she works with to ensure that we are available in an online format as well to address specifically Anamet to the points that you made. And even you think about this session here in the last you know hour and 45 minutes, we've heard from eight speakers from a global perspective. Uh, we weren't able to to I wasn't able to entice anybody from Asia to participate, I think it's like two in the morning there right now, um, or Oceania. So I wasn't able to convince anybody to participate from there. But otherwise, we have representation from um, across the globe for those who are awake at this normal time anyways. So yeah, I, I completely concur that there are some advantages to all of this. Um, so Quok has asked us to turn our cameras on. Quok is our social media guru. Uh, and he has asked us to put our cameras on if you wish, uh, for a photo, um, you will be trending within hours. Of, uh, you know, of, we need to dress up a, a certain way. No, take your hair. <laughs> uh, come out. Uh, I'll take a few glass or I'll take. That's right. <laughs> no, um, uh, and I met the, uh, just uh, as uh, David said, that the, the the future is ours. And uh, ISAPA 2023 will be a very nice opportunity to open the wings of IFAPA to many other uh, partners and stakeholders from XPA, from United Nations, from all the world. We need to, yes, to be together. So, Ana Mete, uh, tomorrow I call you. <laughs> All right, well, this is final final call for you to turn your cameras on if you wish to be on the photograph that's going to be, again, trending globally uh, within a matter of hours after Quok puts it out on Twitter. Um, you and Justin Bieber will be the will be trending uh, later later this evening. 
All right, let me just do this. Okay, so um, I just need to just turn off the transcript, which I'm going to stop recording right now.